Let's go to Skype now for how this is playing inside Iran. Thomas Erdebrink is the New York Times bureau chief in Tehran. What's the mood this morning? Well, you know, it was very interesting. As I um, came back from the press conference with uh, President Rouhani, I was almost embraced by my neighbors who for years have been asking me, Thomas, what will happen with the nuclear program? Where is this heading? Will there be more sanctions? And today, for the first time in a long time, they were all smiling. Before that, um, I was invited to a selected press conference at President Rouhani's office. He said that the regime of sanctions against Iran has now been broken. It's interesting to see the Iranian journalists, who are, of course, first journalists and secondly, Iranians, as they say so themselves, how happy they were, how, how upbeat, and they are sharing a feeling that a lot of people here in Iran are actually uh, at this moment uh, saying they are experiencing, which is one of happiness, of hope. I called to the man who normally exchanged my dollars for me, and he told me that the Iranian national currency, which has lost um, over 100% over the last uh, years uh, because of sanctions to the dollar, had actually gained uh, some strength this morning in another sign that also business people feel that this agreement is one that will bring Iran forward uh, in, the com in the coming months. Thanks for that, Thomas. Our team of experts here now to analyze and debate the deal, ABC's Christian Amanpour and Martha Raditz. The president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Richard Haas, and Bill Crystal, chairman of the Emergency Committee for Israel and editor of the Weekly Standard. Thanks to all of you. And Christian, let me begin with you. We just heard that report from Tehran right there. There was no question that leading up to this agreement, the pressure was really starting to build inside Iran because of the sanctions. And President Rouhani elected in part to get that relief. That's absolutely right. And just anecdotally, when Foreign Minister Zarif came into the press conference in Geneva to announce a deal, there was a huge cheer from the Iranian reporters showing you how much they want this to happen. Because you're right, these sanctions have indeed hurt the Iranian people very, very much, not so much the regime. And I think that, you know, what you just heard from Senator Chambliss and, and others and Secretary Kerry, here's the deal about sanctions. And I think we should be very clear about this. This is what the facts show that sanctions, yes, have really hurt Iran, have hurt the economy, have hurt the people, and were a long way to why Rouhani got elected. But sanctions have not stopped Iran from continuing its nuclear program. You heard what Secretary Kerry said, 160 centrifuges before the sanctions 10 years ago, 19,000 now. So if the deal is to try to get Iran to capitulate and to surrender in terms of finishing their nuclear program, that hasn't worked. So intelligence people here in, in, in Britain and others who are very uh, aware of what's been going on have told me this interim deal is and a good deal. It is significant freezes and, and suspension by Iran for very modest temporary reversible sanction relief by the United and States. And Christian, we saw that reaction from Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel. What about the rest of the region? Well, the rest of the region, it depends on which part of the region. Yes, Israel, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf Arab states freaked out. They do not want to see any lessening of pressure on Iran. Part of it is because Israel is very concerned. The Saudis are, are in a Sunni Shiite, you know, proxy war for influence in that part of the world. They don't want to see any let up on Iran. Uh, other parts of the, that region uh, want to see, uh, uh, you know, less tension. So they want to see a deal. But of course, the deal is six months and we're not going to know what's going to happen in a comprehensive deal that's going to require a lot more from both Iran of, and the United States. A lot of hard partners. negotiating ahead, and that's right. I want to go to Martha Raddus. We're also learning this morning, fascinating, that we not only had these high-level negotiations going on in Geneva, but separate secret talks for the last several months between the United States and Iran. I, I love this part of the story, George. Imagine U.S. officials going over to Oman and in Geneva on a military airplane into Oman. This is the Deputy Secretary of State, William Burns, and a man named Jake Sullivan, who is the principal foreign policy advisor for Joe Biden. They went over there, met with senior Iranian officials, and nobody really knew about this, including some of our closest allies, including Israel. And they basically set the stage. They had about five secret meetings saying, how do we get to talks? At the same time, we're also seeing this big debate now about what this actually does to the Iranian program. Secretary of State Kerry saying it expands the period that it'll take them to get a nuclear weapon. You hear Senator Chambliss completely disagrees. What's the United States estimate for how much time this is buying us? The experts I've spoken to just a short time ago 
believe it doubles the time to break out when when the Iranians could push for a nuclear weapon. The worst case was one to two months. The Israelis certainly believed it would probably happen in one month, maybe just weeks. They believe this would double the time because it eliminates and and the production of 20 percent highly. So not even close to a permanent deal. You're close. calling it, Bill Crystal, just a pause that refreshes the ability of the Iranians to keep going on their program. Right. Taking breakout time from one to two months to two to four months in return for breaking the sanctions regime, that strikes me as a terrible deal. Of course, the Iranian it's regime is very happy with this regime. deal, and our allies are very unhappy with it, and our allies are right to be unhappy. And the Iranian regime, unfortunately, President Rouhani is gloating, and he's right to gloat. But the question, Richard Heise, is going to be, I guess, which is more reversible, the relief of the sanctions or the Iranian program? We're not going to find out until we actually get either to a final deal or this, this unravels. Uh, each side is selling it, that they're basically getting more than, than they're giving up. But I think at the end of the day, George, this is a limited deal that does limited things for limited duration. And the real focus actually should be where we go, not over the next six months. I don't know why, why, why everyone keeps using that time period. It's one year, if you read the text. The goal is within one year to complete the negotiation and begin the, the uh, implementation of the so-called comprehensive follow-on deal that, by the way, is of unknown duration. Big issues to come. So you've been inside the State Department. What will now happen for the next several months? Oh, in, in, well, in the short run, it's going to be defending this amongst, against people, for example, in Congress who are focusing on new sanctions and the rest. But then it's going to be to spell out all the details. There's a, you know, how many centrifuges will Iran ultimately be allowed? Of what modernity? How much enriched uranium, even at a low level, will Iran be, Iran be allowed to keep? What will be the detailed nature of the inspections? How often at what sites? What about sites we may not know about? There is so much that remains to be, to be negotiated here. And Bill, what do you think, how much time do you think Prime Minister Netanyahu is willing to give the United States, clearly at least six months? I'm not so sure about that. I don't think, it's not a matter of him giving the United States time. It's a question of whether Iran could break out to nuclear weapons, whether they could deceive you could even see him during these. You militarily whether before they, the six months Whether up. they could deceive even during the six months. From his point of view, Iran's gamble over the last 10 years of cheating, lying, and deceiving has paid off for them. They are getting sanctions relief, which is really unbelievable, dismantling nothing and getting sanctions the relief. $6 billion. And, and monitoring. And, but, it, but, but you'll never get that. Monitoring. As uh, Secretary Kerry said, they every did, day they'll be in they places not, they haven't been. They apparently, David Sanger reports in the New George. York Times that they did not get the uh, standard of monitoring and inspection that the IAEA wanted. But to answer your question, I don't think the prime minister will think he is constrained by the U.S. deciding to have a six-month deal. As, as Richard says, it's six months, one year. I mean, if, if they're going to break out, they're going to break out. And, and Christian, how much time do you believe that President Rouhani and his team yeah. have to continue the negotiations? They're under some constraints by the Iranian supreme leader as well. They are, but here's the difference. Why hasn't this happened before? Because Iran was unable to do it before. Under the completely contemptible time of Ahmadinejad, there was no way that this was going to happen, and it was static for a long time. Now Rouhani has done what many people think is the impossible, and that he has Khamenei behind him, and Khamenei has brought the other, you know, bits of consensus of Iran behind him for the moment. And by the way, this isn't historic. In 2003, etc., it was frozen for two years and suspended the entire program. So I think in terms of time, where the Israelis are really concerned, it's about the Iraq heavy water reactor. This deal apparently says that they cannot proceed with Iraq, they cannot introduce f fuel into Iraq. And of course, the Israelis have told me that if, you know, they need to, they might go after Iraq even if the U.S. doesn't at all. So I think the Iraq thing is very, very important. And what I'm being told is that in the future, Iraq cannot be a heavy water reactor. It cannot be a plutonium producer, a route to another bomb. It must be converted to a light water reactor. We'll see. Finally, Richard Haas, what are the odds that this actually does lead to a permanent agreement that actually prevents Iran from having a nuclear weapons program? Preventing, it won't do that much. Uh, these, the, you know, the negotiations like this, George, don't solve problems. What they do is manage them. Think of this as a condition to be managed. They'll put ceilings on it, they'll put constraints on it, they'll arrange for uh, inspections. But you're, what you're talking about at the end of the day is how much is Iran going to be allowed and how much time will we have that if Iran decides to cheat or break out, how much warning will we get? It won't do away with the threat of an Iran nuclear program. The real question is how much warning and how much confidence do we have in that warning? And that introduces is either a degree of stability or instability into the Middle East. Okay, thank you all very much.